Ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very good afternoon to you all. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming to our seminar today titled um, Reimagining South Asia, Rise of the BBI and Nations. Uh, today's session, we will be, we'll be discussing how uh, South Asia is being reimagined and how uh, introduce new perspectives on how uh, South Asia may choose their path forward. Uh, to speak on today's session, we are delighted to have with us today Mr. Su uh, Sujeev Shakya who is a non-resident senior fellow at our institute. He is also the chair of uh, Nepal Economic Forum and the founder and CEO of Bead Management Nepal. The chair of today's session will be Dr. Rajni Gamage, who is a postdoctoral fellow at our institution. Um, the session today will also be live streamed on the ISIS Facebook page. And now I will hand it over to Dr. Rajni so we can begin. Thank you, Sad. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and on behalf of, you can hear me, right? Um, on behalf of ISIS and US, I extend a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us today in person as well as uh, online on Facebook. Um, so this is the first ISIS seminar for this year, uh, and we are honored to be joined today by our speaker, Mr. Shujib Shakya, uh, who is here to talk about reimagining South Asia, the rise of BBIN nations. So I will read a few lines about today's seminar from the excerpt. Um, South Asia is currently witnessing an unprecedented transformation. The BBI nations, uh, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, and, in, and um, India is home to nearly 1.6 billion people, uh, and the economic ascent of these nations uh, offer a lot of insights into reshaping the future of connectivity in the region. As the India-Pakistan relationship uh, experiences a thaw and Sri Lanka is going through an economic uh, set of challenges, um, the BBI and nations kind of present, according to Mr. Shakya, um, challenges as well as opportunities. Um, I will also briefly outline the structure of today's uh, seminar, which is that uh, Mr. Shakya will talk for the first 25 minutes, after which uh, he has requested that I ask a few questions for the next 15 minutes, uh, and then the floor will be open to the audience uh, to ask questions. Um, finally, before I hand over uh, to our esteemed speaker, I will give a very brief introduction. Um, Mr. Shakya has asked for a less stiff and formal introduction hims of himself, uh, and this is the version, um, which is that, as mentioned before, he's a non-resident senior fellow at ISAS NUS, um, and he identifies as a pracademic, uh, which is kind of inhabiting the worlds of an academic as well as a practitioner, um, and loves to call himself a common sense specialist. Um, he's the founder of a management consulting firm, runs a think tank, and writes columns and books and speaks on diverse topics. Sujeev Shakya has uh, also been associated with South Asia Trust, uh, publisher of Himal South Asian, uh, as the, and he left South Asia Trust as the chair. Uh, he holds 30 plus years of experience in corporate and the development sector in Asia and Africa. So thank you for joining us today, Mr. Shakya, and I invite you to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Rajni. Good afternoon. Back to be back at ISAS. Thank you. And I've in, been here since last week, and I've really enjoyed doing some writing, doing some reflection. And, uh, and this has also been a very interesting week, because as I was here, the Bangladesh election results came out. Yesterday, the Bhutan results came out. So, and also, uh, the foreign min uh, minister of India uh, Mr. Jay Shankar visited Nepal. So I think we cover all the three BBIN countries. So today's uh, discussion, as uh, Rajni mentioned, maybe 20, 25 minutes, I'll just set the stage and I would love to more interact with uh, Rajni and uh, people here, is that I would talk about the background. And when we talk about South Asia, what do we mean by South Asia and how that evolved over a period of time? And then we talk about what is happening, and uh, we see a sort of a thaw in relations uh, within South Asia, the, the redefinition of South Asia, and then where does this all go, and where does this future looking like, and I would just uh, plug in uh, what uh, I feel, uh, and I've been writing a lot about, and talking a lot about, and working a lot about, is on the BBI and 
informal framework, which is the Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal framework. So, um, so I bring in uh, perspectives of uh, someone who has been working in this field. So Nepal Economic Forum has been the uh, partner from Nepal in the multiple studies that have been done with uh, BBIN. So I have some insights around that. Also some of the clientele I handle on the management consulting side that brings in a perspective of how corporates are thinking, how companies are thinking. And of course, working with the development partners, for instance, multilaterals like World Bank and Asian Development Bank and others, how are they thinking? So a lot of my thought processes are driven from basic work I'm doing and a lot of reading and interactions I've been uh, conducting. So when we talk about uh, South Asia, um, South Asia as a concept has been, been referred to from the time of colonial uh, powers were in the region and uh, at times when the 1971 um, war takes place between India and Pakistan, that's the time when the, the US cables use the word South Asia a lot in terms of referring uh, this region. But then uh, South Asia in terms of uh, its more formulation comes in with the formation of uh, SAC, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation that was in 1985 and the headquarters were established in Kathmandu as, uh, and still uh, despite whatever is happening with SAC, there's a secretary general of SAC that uh, is residing in Kathmandu. So we see a lot of spate of activities and I would say the first uh, uh, decade of uh, the 21st century we saw a lot of uh, of uh, South Asia coming together, a lot of platforms. So for instance, there was uh, the South Asia University that was established in New Delhi 2007. You had the um, South Asia Standards for Arbitration Con Council. You had uh, the South a SAC Development Fund, which is headquartered in Thimpu. Uh, this is a fund to s s do investments in more than two countries. And then you had uh, the South Asian Regional Standards Organization. And also, this is a time I have used to write back in 2004 about a lot of us were writing about a common currency uh, of rupa, that is, be a currency of South Asia. So it was a very forward-thinking uh, stuff that was happening during that time. And, and uh, then there were multiple organizations that mushrooms at that point of time that were partnered between different uh, uh, South Asian organizations. You had the South uh, Asia Trade Watch, Sorti, uh, Pushpa is here. He was leading that institution out of uh, in Kathmandu. We had uh, one of our senior fellows here at ISAS is uh, Nishal Pandey from Nepal. He leads, still leads COSAT. This is a consortium of uh, think tanks of South Asia. So a lot of platforms. And, that's, and this was also the time when I was pretty active with the South Asia Trust, the publishers of the Himalaya Mag Himal magazine, South Asian magazine. All, all of used to do cartoon congress, films festivals, a lot of activities were taking place. And this was really heightened with, uh, and this was really going well. And uh, when Prime Minister Modi uh, was installed in 2014, he decided to invite all the heads of state of SAC. And so on 26 May, I think, uh, 2014, you had all the head of states of SAC uh, being present at Prime Minister Modi's um, installation. And we also saw that he really took neighborhood first seriously. Uh, Bhutan was the first country he visited, and then he visited Nepal. So this is all going well till the SARC summit in November happens, and Pakistan uh, decides not to sign the um, multi-model vehicle agreement. So there was a motor vehicle agreement that was, um, was the draft was ready. The summit was taking place in Kathmandu, and then it doesn't get signed. So that's when the thaw begins. And that was the last summit SARC had. So this is now going to be nine years ago. This is November of 2014. So that led to uh, the formation of uh, BBIN, uh, the idea of um, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal getting together. So if the larger South Asia is not working, uh, then let's look at BBIN. I'll come to that. So what's happening currently we see is that um, we see that uh, the major challenge within SAC and also the 
uh, issue around South Asia gets hijacked by the issue around India and Pakistan. And that was a, a contentious issue that's running in for many decades. And I think that's, that becomes most of the institutions that I go to in the US also whenever they have something on South Asia, it's something on India, Pakistan, but then we say that there are other seven, five, seven, five countries also that we should be talking about. Uh, also, we see that uh, we need to recalibrate how we look at the region, and especially um, we see how the assertion of India, uh, the hosting of the G20, the arrival of uh, India on the global stage as it is uh, trying to push. Um, and uh, 2019, uh, the foreign minister, Mr. Jay Shankar, gets appointed, and he's, in his book, he talks about you know, if you would have read it, the India way, and that we've seen, especially in the Ukraine conflict, uh, India is asserting itself to say that this is, we are going to deal this in our own way. Uh, so we will buy oil from Russia, pay in Chinese one, that is our way of dealing. So it doesn't, I don't need to listen to others. I will find my own way. And so this is a very assertive India that we are looking at, India that has grown uh, very well in economically in the past uh, decade and India which has got global aspiration. And so that is the context that we need to look at to see that can we look at, how, or how do we look at um, putting our engine, hitching our uh, wagons to the engine of India's growth. So that's, that's one big thing we can look at. In terms of the region, we see bilaterally uh, the relationships are working better. Uh, so the Bangladesh election just concluded. Uh, now we have Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina back into power. Um, this is after 15 years. She's going to be there for another five years for sure. Uh, so there's been a deeper relationship between um, Bangladesh and not only India, but with, we've seen a relationship with India, Nepal, with Bhutan deepening. Bhutan just had its uh, election results yesterday. Uh, Prime Minister Chiring Topke coming back as the Prime Minister. Uh, so we would see he's someone who has really tried to push uh, regional integration. Uh, the motor vehicle agreement got stuck with the last government in Bhutan, and we would see that there would be a revival of uh, regional uh, cooperation discussions that would be uh, taking place. And, um, and so, we, that's, this has led to perhaps the right foundation. And in Nepal, we had a Prime Minister, uh, sorry, Foreign Minister Jai Shankar visit uh, in the first week of January of this year. And uh, there's been an agreement with India on uh, export of 10,000 megawatts of power. And also, uh, there has been a trilateral agreement on export of power from Nepal to Bangladesh uh, being wheeled through. Uh, India. So this is, uh, which has been discussed about, but it's moving into a reality. Uh, in the region, uh, beamstake and maritime agreements, uh, be it pushed by Quad and other uh, sort of uh, geopolitical realignment, uh, that's been moving. Asian highways, are mov the project is moving well, and uh, I think uh, the Re the dreams of being able to drive from Kathmandu to Vietnam or from Dhaka to Vietnam or from you know, any of the Indian cities to uh, Vietnam is going to be a reality very soon. So that's, that's a fascinating uh, sort of piece of uh, futuristic thing we have to look at. So, um, so for in that uh, perspective, uh, we're seeing increased uh, interactions between the BBIN countries. Uh, we've seen um, that uh, a hydropower project in Tripura gets underway through transportation of equipment uh, from Beng West Bengal to uh, Tripura via uh, uh, Bangladesh and not coming through the chicken neck and Siliguri. Uh, we see now the people to move people movement, uh, Dhaka Kathmandu bus service is going to restart. It just had started pre uh, COVID, but we are going to see that happening. And uh, energy exports, as I was mentioning earlier, from Nepal to uh, Bangladesh and perhaps from Bangla uh, Bhutan to Bangladesh, uh, wheeled through India. And the energy market as such, it's not only about just uh, selling through agreements, but uh, selling to market energy exchanges, that's becoming a, a, a reality. Um, so when I look at South Asia, when we are looking at reimagining, I think in 2014 I wrote about East, so dividing South Asia into three. So we have the East South Asia. So when we look at BBI countries, we have the 
West South Asia, so Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the western parts of India, which is a more complicated part, and then we have the South South Asia, Sri Lanka, Maldives, and the Southern India. So if we, so for India per se, at, India is also that's what we see in Kathmandu is India is also looking at a different way of engaging with different countries through different regions. Like for instance, and also the compulsion of the differences in federal government and the local government. Like for instance, the engagement with Bhutan. Uh, so the current border in Bhutan goes through a place called Jaigaon in India, which is in the West Bengal uh, province or state of India, whereas which has always had a different government than the federal government in uh, India. So there has been issues in moving a lot of things ahead. So just last month, there's been an announcement of a city project on the Indian border on the uh, Assam side of the Indian state, which is in Bongaigao and uh, across is called the city of Gelefu in uh, Bhutan, which is being developed as a mindfulness city by the government of Bhutan in with a close engagement of India, perhaps investments from India. So this is a sort of thing that's happening. And so it's also there are um, realities within India. And perhaps there's a realities within we in Nepal, we see as we have seven provinces, some dealing with uh, some of the provinces on a geopolitical perspective is more challenging than other provinces. So this is something uh, that, uh, that we see uh, uh, we are going on. So. Um, so also, while people also feel that there is a more tribal, more inward-looking uh, perspectives around the world, and trade is not happening, and people are just trying to look inward, but we see that uh, as the WTO head talks about re-globalization, we would see globalization taking place shape in a different way, and uh, we are not going to be able to stop people, goods, or services moving, and especially in the days of communication, especially in the day of internet, especially in the day of technology, that's not going to be possible. So so how do we adapt to that? Uh, that's that's one big thing that we, uh, that is, uh, needs to, the trend we are seeing. The second is that, and uh, learning from uh, countries like Switzerland, uh, interactions in Switzerland, which is bordered with uh, very powerful nations like France and Germany and Italy, they have been able to navigate themselves. And having been working in Rwanda for 12 years and looking at the development of East Asia, uh, Africa cooperation and to see uh, a small country like Rwanda being able to navigate itself with uh, different um, larger countries, be it, the, uh, be it Congo, be it Tanzania, be it Uganda. Uh, so we've seen there's a lot of lessons we can learn as to how how if you need something that you need to approach and i think the analogy i use is that if you've got a as a child if you you know you've got a child and you want to find an admission in a school then they, you have to make the effort of going in and finding the going to the school the school is not going to come to you so as a small nation as a nation with a lesser economic power that's what we need to do is to be able to and i think rather than trying to see that what you would be bestowed upon or what are you going to get how do you negotiate uh, your position uh, because your geography is not going to be changed but it is to about leveraging uh, the geography we have so let me stop here and maybe yeah take some questions and then you know I think I'm more yes. you know sort of better when there are questions and to discuss more on that right thank you mr. Shakya I won't take up too much of time asking questions um, maybe I'll ask a few and then open it to the audience and then if there's time maybe ask a few more um, but I thought that was a very comprehensive discussion uh, of developments in the region and then concepts of sub regionalism I thought perhaps I'll start off the discussion with uh, this idea of a regional identity. So what does it mean to be South Asian? And you discuss quite a, quite a lot in your writings uh, what it means to be South Asian and the extent to which a collective identity has been present and how it has evolved over time. And then you also talk about a sub-regional identity, such as the BBIN identity. So the question I wanted to ask is, as much as there are challenges and opportunities to fostering such an identity, how important is a collective identity in the first place. Because as you mentioned, collaborations at the bilateral level, they are, they are ongoing even as we speak. So what is the value of a collective identity? Uh, thanks, very interesting question. Yeah, I think uh, the identity as a South Asian is a bit on the wane as we see. And this is from, um, from 
South Asians that in the 90s and the early 2000s used to have a lot of them and a lot of uh, gatherings that are taking place. And people are very proud to identify themselves as uh, South Asians. And I think, uh, you know, uh, your former director here, Raja Mohan, and people like them would have just, you know, I mean, they were big campaigners of this whole identity around South Asia. And that's been on a way. And also we see that globally, people are taking up sub-identities more than the larger identity. And this has been some of the uh, work that I've been researching on to see that um, there are identities around um, your own country. And I, like, for instance, um, in, in the US, um, when, as you know, when I was there 20 years ago, you know, you, you had a, you were easy to identify yourself as a South Asian because a lot of us were looking for joint identity. So you could be a Pakistani, a Bangladeshi. But now you have a sizable Nepali population there. And now within Nepalese also, there are sub-identities emerging. So it's also, I think, it's also because of the social media. It's also about how you identify yourself. It's not the physical identification also. Today, your identification is more your virtual identification. So I love reading LinkedIn profiles and you know how people identify themselves on a, you know, their Facebook profile and a LinkedIn profile. So that's, you know, I mean, there are very few people who would say they are South Asians now. You know, so that's, that's changing. And I think it's perhaps the, uh, the larger, uh, larger identity issue. Also, people don't mind. And we've seen with ASEAN, and even if you see in Europe, uh, EU, you could belong to different uh, countries, but you could have a, a sort of a, your own uh, larger identity when it comes to uh, economy, when it comes to development. And I think that's also changing. Uh, so that's that's something that we can also see, like in ASEAN, you just you know, uh, you have your individual identities that are based on your country, but you you have a joint identity whenever it's needed. So that's that's the sort of the evolving thing I see, and it's pretty sad also because uh, you know, a lot of uh, South Asian uh, writers, thinkers now they they have stopped identifying themselves uh, as South Asians. That's a bit sad. Mm -hmm. Um, second question, kind of, I want to talk about the elephant in the room, which is um, China. Mm. And when we reimagine South Asia, uh, to what extent do external forces play in this reimagination of South Asia? And understandably, sub regional kind of collectives like BBIN um, can exclude, say, for instance, Pakistan and Sri Lanka in a BBIN collective. But as we know, these are also you know, strong footholds of certain geopolitical maneuvering that is happening. Um, so I wanted to kind of ask how these geopolitical contestations manifest? How does it impact uh, a sub-regional or a regional identity and then reimagining this, the future of this region? I think as far as China is concerned, and especially as we speak now, and these are conversations that last week here I've been meeting people and that's also coming out, is that uh, for China, um, a, they have larger problems to look at, and I don't think South Asia is, at this point of time, a priority. I know that's what a lot of even China scholars are saying. And they also have, like for instance, when bilateral meetings happen with Nepal, uh, even the last one, they, they basically tell you, we are very far off from you guys. You know, you just work out with India. And this has been the successive message, uh, like in my books I write about, say, when. Uh, in the 60s, 80s, you know, so till you know, uh, 2016, seven visits, and the, you know, the, la the last visits of our leaders and uh, uh, Chinese leaders coming in. So that's that's one. And and within the within BBI, and if you see, Bhutan is works with uh, India very closely. China is still distant. Uh, they are just trying to sort out the border, and I think uh, it's very clear. With Bangladesh, it is balanced as we were discussing while over lunch, is that has been able to balance all these powers very well. And uh, with Nepal, um, we also see that China is, for them, the politics is the secondary part. They need to see economic activities taking place. And if they don't see that, I don't think the, their interest wanes. And this is especially when I look at uh, in Africa, this is what we see a lot, is that China gets very interested if there are some um, economic uh, you know, activities possible for them. Uh, so from that perspective, they, as long as 
the Chinese, as we work uh, with the, some of the think tanks, they are very clear that as long as this region does not become a, a point where there's going to be the Tibet issue being raised and there are going to be problems around Tibet from here, they are very happy that this, this region moves the way it moves. So uh, Ch China is in the room in between, say, 2018, 19, they did want to, you know, and especially post Doklam, they wanted to engage, but they also realized that uh, they are too far uh, from our culture, our thinking, the way we, you know, act, we behave, and uh, yeah. And also, while there's a lot of rhetoric on, and especially for countries like Nepal, uh, getting close to China, and as a Chinese scholar uh, uh, told me that the day you guys are going to start marrying, doing your weddings like uh, Chinese weddings and not like uh, Bollywood weddings, then you would realize that you would be coming close to us. You know, so so that's the sort of uh, the larger issue, and we. And uh, till now, we feel that until us, there's going to be some real major uh, uh, skirmishes that would convert into uh, uh, wars in the region. I don't see much. At least that's how we see it sitting in Nepal. Right. OK. Um, during your talk, you talked about reimagining um, sub-regional identity. Um, a reimagination of South Asia in the form of the BBIN, so sub-regional identity. Um, and the question that I wanted to ask you is that we know at the same time there are other sub-regional conceptualizations, such as BIMSTEC and, and so on. Um, so do you see certain tensions uh, between these various formulations? Maybe there are reimaginations that are perhaps contradictory to a sub-regional sentiment. How do you foresee that? Uh, See, I'm, I'm driven more from a private sector mindset and economic development and you know, creation of job mindset. So from that perspective, the more the merrier. So you look at different uh, permutations and equations, and then you say that what works. And again, I go back to uh, uh, a country like Rwanda, which went on to, ho though they were never a British colony, they went on to host the Commonwealth Summit. Uh, they are still the head of the, uh, they were the head of the, uh, Francophone countries, uh, they were, you know, they are engaged with the African Union, they are equally, I mean, they've got multiple places they get into, and so that wherever there's benefit in terms of um, private sector engagement, economic development, there's more trade, investment, so that's, so that's the sort of, uh, if you take that mindset, so BIMSTEC has its own objective, and uh, the, the BBIN energy network would definitely complement what is the BIM, BIMSTEC energy network would be coming in. This is what we very clearly see. Uh, so tourism, there could be another, you know, sort of coalitions coming around tourism. Uh, say, for instance, the Buddhist uh, circuit we are talking about, or the, the Ramayana circuit that is coming about, you know. So, so there are multiple, uh, multiple sort of developments that are taking place. So I would see they are more uh, complementary uh, than competing with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, like last week only with uh, Nilanjan Ghosh of ORF, I just, we just published a, a, a concept on NIB, Nepal, India, Bangladesh, and especially on, you know, sort of uh, looking at energy and trade and tourism. So very uh, specific, another subgrouping within the BBI and grouping. So I think that's where, uh, that's my personal opinion in terms of looking at uh, multiple cooperation frameworks that would complement each other. Thank you. Uh, we have a bit more time before we open uh, the floor to the audience, so I'll go move on to my next question, um, which is that in some of your writings you have mentioned uh, the possibility of collaboration over in the context of rising digitization and digitalization, uh, and even the prospect of a common regional digital currency. Um, and my question is, how much of a bargain do you expect the smaller BBIN countries uh, to reach with a large economy such as India? And this is a very common kind of concern and insecurity often within the smaller countries in the region. Um, do you think India sees the value or is ready to, you know, take, to capitalize on a certain environment of policy maturity in, in response to this? No, I think this is already happening. So. Uh, among the BBI and countries, uh, Bhutan has a one is to one currency parity with the Indian rupee. We, uh, Nepal, we have uh, 1 1.6 to one Indian rupee that has been running for past 
30 plus years. Uh, and then it's only Bangladesh that doesn't have a, you know, a, a fixed convertible, uh, fixed rate with uh, India. And now the digital platforms are already working. So uh, at least with Nepal, uh, it has started. So last time when I was traveling in Kerala, I could use my Nepal QR code to on eSeva to transact in India. And Indian uh, tourists and travelers are being able to use their QR. So this, the, the, wherever the UPI platform is being acceptable, it's not proliferated because there are one or two technical things to be sorted out, but it's already happening. And it's the same thing will start happening in Bhutan, and I think will start happening in Bangladesh. So it's, this is already happening. And uh, we see this will only increase. And I think all the countries also don't mind doing this. Uh, because it then passes, all this is passes through the central bank network. So things like one of the biggest challenges within these countries are money laundering, you know, sort of uh, financing of um, illegal, illicit activities across these countries that are happening with cash. That also is going to reduce, at least you'll know what's happening. And uh, easier spend. So if you look at in the border areas, I mean, people not being having to carry cash and just, you know, the digital transactions taking place. Uh, so that's a, that's a huge benefit. So this is already happening in some of these countries. It's only now, I think by 2024 end, we would see, even by, I think it's April for Nepal and Bhutan with India. It's only with Bangladesh we are figuring out how we are going to make this work, but uh, I think it's only a matter of time. So this, this, this is again going to change the way trade, commerce, investments, uh, tourism, everything flows. Um, final two questions. Um, question is on media and how important is media uh, when we reimagine a regional identity or a sub-regional identity. And as we are aware, in the current context, um, there's a lot of information overload, um, many different media platforms, mainstream social media and so on. Um, and in this context, sometimes there is disinformation, there is um, various narratives that are kind of consumed by the publics of these countries. Uh, so I wanted to ask, how would that factor in uh, in the conceptualization of a regional identity? I don't know. Media globally is facing uh, major challenges. So it's not in our region. So if you look at you know what's happening in the US uh, with the elections looming this year and how that's going to shape up. So if it's happening in countries like that where there's so much of uh, uh, compliance is regulation, so you can imagine, you know, the challenges in our region. But uh, it's the openness of media is always going to be a challenge. I think, uh, say, if you look at Himal per se, uh, it could not be published out of Kathmandu, then you had to shift it. Now, currently, it's published out of Colombo, Sri Lanka, and so these are uh, uh, multi uh, sort of uh, multi country platforms are going to have challenges uh, that uh, would be there. But it's also that there are, uh, it's at the end of the day, uh, over a period of time, we see credible sources and not so credible sources. And uh, that's where uh, we have to see quality versus quantity. While there'll be a, a lot of stuff coming out on uh, media, it's about who do you really read, what do you do. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. I mean, like in Nepal, there are 2,200 online platforms. Uh, but there are only five or six we really go through. Uh, same thing with India and same thing in Bangladesh. So it's it's that uh, credibility matters. And uh, also the, the sort of uh, tacit uh, support and understanding uh, and sharing uh, amongst each the credible uh, sor media sources, that is also going to be important. And I think, uh, like the other day, a piece came up. I think a Sunday Observer in Sri Lanka published it. Tells the, uh, you know, Dhaka, somebody will pick it up. There are credible things. People are going to pick it up. I think that's where we would see. And uh, you know, sort of, there's a lot of stuff that gets dumped. Right. Final question is that I noticed in most of your writing, you talk about the potential of youth mm. um, playing a significant role in reimagining South Asia. Mm. Um, and we also see youth uh, engaged in a lot of protest movements mm. um, and even uprisings in countries such as Sri Lanka in 2022 and in other contexts in the region as well. Um, so I wanted to ask the question of how equipped are South Asian economies uh, to engage with youth and to co-opt with the youth uh, in their future development? Um, 
I think I, I go back to uh, something very interesting uh, Gurcharan Das, this Indian thought leader, wrote in his uh, piece uh, about when he was questioned about uh, the Arab Spring, what would happen if in India something like Arab Spring would take place and would you know, regimes change. And uh, he was of the opinion that you know, South Asia behaves in a different way. And we've seen uh, multiple of these uh, uh, of these movements take place. In Nepal also we um, saw a 10 years of insurgency. But that's on a long term, you know, sort of uh, all these people get converted to mainstream usual South Asian politics. And that's what we have seen. So there may be disruption in the short, uh, short run, uh, which we saw in Nepal for 10 years, Sri Lanka we're seeing, you know, parts of India we see. But long run, that does not really change the way you know, we, uh, that uh, sort of a trajectory of a country or the regional cooperation goes. And that's been uh, how I personally see it. I mean, we, I know a lot of people disagree from in that perspective, but uh, even after, you know, we had, a, as we, I could speak for Nepal, 10 years of insurgency, a lot of young people recruited into armed forces, 13,000 people died, but then when we, you know, we come back and then the same, uh, politicians, the leaders of the insurgency are all co-opted to mainstream politics. And that's what tends to happen. And we see in Sri Lanka at the end of the day, it's the same set of people who would come back mm -hmm. uh, to power, mm -hmm. you know, whatever may happen. You know? yes. I agree. Um, thank you. I think my role in this is more or less done. I'm opening the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, maybe you could identify yourself uh, and then ask a question. Thank you. And happen to be from the Indo-Nepal border, <laughs> from Nainital. Okay. And I have lots of family in exactly in Tanakpur, which is closer to the border. Uh, so th one of the themes that came up was the fragmented identity of people formerly called South Asians. And I just thought, um, just quoting somebody else. I am not a writer, so I have to depend on others' quotes. As William Faulkner said, the past is never dead, and it's not even the past. When the British left India, there were 562 different kingdoms. Barely half a dozen of them were of viable size at all. And the largest of them, Kashmir, just fell apart once Pakistan is attacked. So the history of the entire area has been of very you know, fragile states, very small states, some of them was as small as 40 square kilometers, 2,000 population, 10,000 rupees annual revenue, but they stayed, but they existed. I don't know why. So when we look at bringing up, bringing all these people under some sort of South Asian identity, I don't think that will happen. And it was very interesting from you to hear that even the sub-Nepalese identities they have now started playing up. Um, and then uh, continuing with the theme of history, uh, Professor Mabubani recently wrote that it's difficult to believe, I'm not quoting verbatim, just roughly, that just a hundred years back, only a hundred thousand, that was a little bit of an understatement, was 160,000. Englishmen ruled over 340 million Indians. So now when you put all these two things, two things together, what is it that we got wrong and we got fragmented? And what is it that people from such a small island half the world across got it right and they were able to put together effectively what is today's India. Um, and, and how do these two contrasting dynamics will play out in bringing some stability to a, to a region that seems very peaceful, but there's always a lot of stuff bubbling under. We saw what happened in Manipur. You know, 32 lakh population, 3.2 point, um, million population. And a country of 140, 1.4 billion just didn't know how to control 3.2 million. It went on and on for s two months. Uh, but that's one question. If if we put juxtapose all of today's hopes and aspirations against the really inexorable flow of history, do we have it in us to change our historical habits? Okay. Sorry, that was a long question. No, thank you. It's very interesting uh, the way you uh, put it. And uh, I think it's also about 
hundred years ago, as the wars were raging, you know, you had to look at whether which side of the global war you were in, and at times you are put into that uh, position. Today, as you know, um, the you know Gaza, uh, the conflict in Gaza, conflict in Ukraine, uh, it's not only about sub identity, but in the larger identity, you you are identified. Like today, if I would um, you know retweet um, someone who is being very sympathetic with Gaza. I would get a lot of, you know, yesterday only I got a lot of people I had to block. Uh, so so this, is, this is a larger identity issue that's going on. But also it's about, in a globalized world, uh, what is it, what does identity mean for you? That is also changing. And that's what, for me, as I you know, sort of, uh, as I said, as she introduced me, I'm not an academic, so I run a consulting firm, I do business, I've got interest in 100 different things. And the way I see it is that the day before I was uh, tweeting a piece on Taylor Swift coming to uh, you know, Singapore, a Bloomberg piece, it's amazing how there's a cult. You know, somebody makes a billion dollars by just doing shows, or you attend a Coldplay uh, show and you see how there, you know, a band comes up with a sustainability report, and that's just being discussed. And uh, so this is a lot. And then you want to identify with Coldplay sustainability. You want to identify with uh, Taylor Swift. You want to identify with uh, Korean fashion. You want to identify with uh, different things that are transnational, globalized. You know, you, you know, everybody loves to show up there. The latest iPhone, you know, 15 Pro. You know, it's it's a it's a tribe you have created, as Seth Godin says. You know, so it's a so that identity is also there. So how many people are really interested in the the the, the identities of nations and subnations? That's one, as I was saying earlier. Also, the social media and other is also the realization that is coming out. Like, for instance, when I talk about Nepal, and you know, we are 123 ethnic groups, 130 languages. You know, Nepal itself, you know, is so. So now people are emerging with their and and uh, social media has given this platform. Suddenly, I see this festival taking place in far west of Nepal. I have never heard about, but there are. It's a huge thing for that 30,000 people out there, 40,000 people out there. So the, the whole identity is changing, and also the larger identities are changing. As I uh, write about, say, the Nepali identity in US, you could be a, a Bhutanese refugee settled in US, uh, uh, or you could be a Burmese Nepali who went from Thailand. But your larger identity there becomes a Nepali because you're a Nepali, the language becomes your identity. You know, so there are different drivers of identity. Uh, but then I look at coming together is always when there is some economic uh, goal. So if you look at people who play, you know, who are engaged in PUBG a lot, and it's a fascinating phenomena uh, I look at. And you see there's a whole community. There's an online community of uh, gamers. So that's, that's what is also changing, and especially among the youth. And when you're talking about a region where 50% of the population is under 25, their definition of what forms their identity you know, and which we saw in the release of Barbie, uh, the movie, how people wanted to, you know, sort of uh, tag their identity with it. So there are global identities, there are very, you know, localized identities, and we are traversing between that. That's where I see. And so the political identity, how important uh, is that and the identity of your, you know, the region you belong to in the future? That's something. And we hope that that's not going to create the situation like earlier where you will find colonization. Now it's colonization of a different kind where you have a company in uh, US that would have a billion plus subscribers who are, we are, you know, tomorrow that company goes bust, we have, you know, I lose all my friends <laughs> on Facebook, you know, or, or uh, if I am, when TikTok went off in India, you saw how people just, you know, felt uh, so much, you know, sort of incapacitated because your connection to the world went away. So, so there are newer things that, uh, uh, that are happening. Sorry, long answer to a long question. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. yeah uh, my name is Asma and I teach in Pakistan. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So um, you already, although you mentioned about China, but still um, my concerns are that how uh, you are going to compete in the market. Uh, so your border, uh, you, one side in India, another side from China. So I was looking into the different data sets, and I realized that recently Nepal signed many uh, transit and trade agreements with China. 
So, uh, and you also mentioned about the 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 the, the, the connectivity uh, initiatives. But uh, how do you see it with the, in comparison with the one road one road one belt initiative of China? Uh, and uh, uh, the other question is that uh, uh, currently, uh, how much Nepal is using the and getting benefit from the ports in India? Uh, this is my uh, second question. Um, thank you. OK, let me take the uh, second one first. So we are completely dependent on Indian ports. We are landlocked. So we have a transit agreement with uh, India. And uh, also Bangladesh, we just signed. But uh, it's still a challenge to uh, logistical challenge, because the Indian ports has been what we have been using for centuries. That's more established. Um, so Nepal uh, signed uh, the agreements with China. It was more of a retaliation after the Indian blockade of 2015. And so we had to you know, sort of uh, get ourselves out of being India locked. And then that's how uh, Nepal signed. But we've seen commercially it doesn't really work very well because it's cheaper to uh, ship something through Guangzhou to, um, to Calcutta and transport it through overland than to get it on a truck from Guangzhou to you know Nepal border. So that because of the terrain. So let's not forget it's a it's a very Himalayan terrain. And our border to the north, while we are connected, uh, land linked, uh, there are only three million people in the entire Tibet Autonomous Region. So it's a very sparsely populated China that we are connected with. Uh, the main center, if you look at Lhasa itself, is about 400 miles, about 708, close to 750 kilometers from Kathmandu. And from there, you go to Chengdu, is about 2,200 kilometers. So it, this is pretty far. So the distances don't make the economic sense for transit. So let's see if the trains would come, which has come up to Kerung, which is about uh, about 40 kilometers uh, north of the uh, Nepal border once the trains would come to Kerung and actually there would be trains that could come to you know, Nepal, Kathmandu, which is the feasibility is happening. Uh, like now, if you look at from Beijing to Lao, the train line has uh, come in. So if there's something like that would happen, then they would. But then again, for China, would they be spending billions of dollars to build that train line if there is no economic benefit? Until unless, which is the trilateral that China has been trying to push, is to use Nepal as a transit point to transport goods from China to India. Now, if that happens, and that was happening to a, uh, to a certain extent, because uh, I keep writing about how Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping met 18 times since in the last decade. So this was building up. The trilateral was building up. So India would bring up the train up to Kathmandu. Then there's be you know, a set of train from from the north and so Nepal. So if that is there, then China, it's worth for China to invest billions of dollars on the railway line. But if you're talking about just exports to Nepal uh, from China, then it doesn't make economic sense for uh, China to put in that money. And I think, as uh, you was mentioning, as also as, as I saw uh, Mr. Kishore Mabubani last week, and he says China always deals on economics. For them, it's, you know, if there's no economic sense, then they are not very keen. It's not about transporting soldiers or you know, weapons for them. You can take goods, services, you can make money out of it. And this is what we've seen in working in Africa. It's very clear. It's very transactional. It's very economics oriented. And if they don't see that, then the market of Nepal, 30 million people, a long you know, sort of transit over the Himalayas, uh, expensive building infrastructure around, you know, it doesn't really make sense. Hopefully it answers your question. Any more questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, as we're talking of this sub-regional initiative, BBIN, as you rightly said, because the regional initiative was not working, so perhaps the countries wanted to go for sub-regional ones, thinking that this might work. But what we also are seeing is, even within the BBIN, uh, this is just an initiative, right? And uh, the countries are starting with the Mortal Vehicles Agreement. And in the last hour, Bhutan again pulled out because it said that it's not yet ready. Uh, we will. We are yet to see whether, with the change of government, there will be a change again in the mindset, and then they would be coming in. But I don't think that might happen even with the with this uh, change of government anytime soon. So, as you write in the ORF, 
uh, actually the NIB or BIM is already taking place by itself, right? With one B being out of the MBA. And as I was thinking through about this energy cooperation that's taking place within the sub-region, it's more, again, on a bilateral basis that has taken place, for example, India, Nepal, and Bhutan, India. Now, with this demand from Bangladesh also coming in, and Bhutan, in, uh, sorry, Bangladesh, India, and uh, Nepal, having a discussion to go on for a tripartite agreement for energy cooperation, again, it's the NIB that's there. Whereas the energy uh, sector is very important for Bhutan itself, and then the trade on energy trade between Bhutan and India is already there. And Bangladesh has also shown some interest in terms of buying electricity from Bhutan. So if the BBI initiative was to move forward from MVA to, say, perhaps take one more sector, energy, and if the whole initiative, the four of them, could go together, then perhaps we might see or there could be some sort of an encouragement to the others that this sub initiative is moving a little forward. So looking at what is happening, that the three countries are moving together in terms of uh, the issues in which they have interest, whereas the other one is not coming in, could it be the case, at least for the you know, near future, that because the bilateral ones have already been working, so the countries want to stick to these bilateral kind of initiatives and mechanisms, and where necessary or where it's important, the tripartite ones will go forward, but the BBI initiative itself might also have to wait for, you know, I don't know how long uh, to, to see uh, some developments taking place. So if that becomes the case, how do we reimagine South Asia even at the sub-regional level? That's my question. No, thank you. Thanks. Um, See, um, on the motor vehicle agreement, uh, Bhutan has some reservations. It will come with it, and you have to uh, respect that reservation and to see how. Uh, but then, for them, there is also benefit in terms of, uh, of signing into the motor vehicle. And it's not only motor vehicle. The second stage of protocols that have been built is on the multimodal transport. So it is not only motor vehicles. We are talking about waterways. You are talking about railways. You are talking about air. Uh, air connectivity, so that's that's the protocols are being uh, looked at, and uh, after that is the energy protocols have been already starting to be discussed, and on the energy there is already some work that was done uh, quite you know a decade over a decade back is called the SARI, the South Asia Regional Initiative, and that is the revi that's the revival that everybody is looking at because um, energy exports and energy uh, exports would be to a market. So there'll be an exchange. So perhaps a BBI and energy exchange or whatever energy exchange. So the sale is not going to be bilateral between power purchase agreement between country A to country B. I think with Nepal self-sufficient in power and uh, self-sufficient in power, the demand, you know, the energy market in India growing pretty well um, and uh, trading, which means that you have peak energy pricing, you have different uh, energy pricing for different time of the year, different days of the year, time of the, uh, time of the day. So that's what we will see. And so that's, that's an obvious movement we'd see. And that's where also the BBI and, uh, uh, sort of BBI and platform is uh, required. And we would see that growth. I think it's only, again, a matter of time. But that's some work that is happening. Um, again, on the sub-regional front, one of the things adding to what you're saying is we're going to be important to look at is that this region and the what does this BBI border? It borders the ASEAN, okay, and this is a you know a, a a region that is growing at a very good pace. And if you look at China's trade, earlier we were discussing with ASEAN is now more than China's trade with the United States, and that's where China is also reimagining how it engages in the region. Okay, so uh, so we're looking at BBI as a you know your your say if you're doing energy, your collective um, sort of bargaining power increases as a region, as a, as a you know sort of a consortium of a network, than as an individual country. Uh, and technology, given the technology, given uh, the need, there is anything is possible. Like I was uh, being told about um, uh, energy exports from Nepal being possible to Vietnam, to even Sri Lanka, and there have been discussions that are coming up because. The technology around transmission, the way transmission takes place, uh, uh, reduction in transmission losses, are uh, and the transmission networks 
are bringing about new ways of looking at markets, which means that you have to group uh, to, to be able to have a collective bargaining power. That also would push, I am hoping, push this BBIN or NID or these type of subgroupings so that you have, if you're negotiating with, uh, say, the ASEAN, you have a bigger, better collective bargaining power. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the enlightened uh, presentation. I'm Priya Lal from the Uni Global Union. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I just take from the first gentleman's question about the identity. Of course, in South Asia, uh, we maintain the colonial identity. I mean, that is why we have all these uh, things. But now, it's the time has come for the digital identity. Maybe uh, it might eliminate most of the uh, problems that we... My question is, uh, again, connected with energy, but not with the energy that we are but the food security, energy for humans. Now, with this climate change related issues, all of us in South Asia, and we are going to face a, a, a big issue. So do you think uh, in terms of, I mean, we have resources everywhere, but you know, how do we match between when the need arises? Should we not think uh, as a energy as a, a platform for us to get together? Yeah, I think we have a food security expert here, so I don't want to, you know, uh, get into his uh, areas of expertise. But uh, definitely, if we've seen uh, that COVID-19 was a very good test case in terms of to test uh, capabilities and uh, your resilience of uh, the region. And um, I totally agree, climate change is you know, going to impact how agriculture is being done, everything. But if you look at the climate change, this type of impacts uh, that is happening has been happening for many centuries. So it's not that suddenly we are having a, a, a change uh, that's coming in. The, so that's why also this uh, regional cooperation is very important so that uh, there is a better and easier movement of goods and services, and especially during emergencies. And uh, I remember during the COVID-19 time, we had, had really pushed hard for a, um, have been a propagand of a border economic zone, and especially during the, in the border areas, as to how you create joint mechanisms for you know sort of uh, to uh, to respond to crisis emergencies um, like earthquakes, like floods, and where you are saying, oh, you are from India, or you are from Nepal or Bangladesh, don't say that. You are a human being. You need something. And so, how do you create these mechanisms? So, if you have a, a regional cooperation framework, then creating these uh, sort of uh, uh, mechanisms are much more uh, easier, you know, and so so that may be a way of uh, you know a way of ensuring yourself against some of these disasters and challenges that will come out of be it through uh, climate change impact, be it through natural disasters, be it through you know uh, issues that will come out of food security. So that's why the the, the larger um, ecosystem of regional cooperation is. Uh, a robust economic co uh, co regional cooperation is required uh, so that these uh, these mechanisms have legitimacy uh, in terms of operating. Like which SARC did, to a, like when SARC was there, when you talk about SAFTA, then you talk about, uh, say, the SDF. There was a legitimate structure that was there because of the larger SARC structure. So, so that is going to be important to create this uh, acceptable uh, economic network, informal or formal network structure so that these mechanisms become possible. Yeah. We have about 15 minutes more to go, so a few yeah. more questions are welcome. Yeah, yeah. That's a lady up there. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I just have one question. Um, just as you mentioned now, Bibbon as a concept lacks a legitimized uh, grounding. It's more initiative, Dr. Pushpa also said that. So. And when we think about Bibbin and in the terms of economic opportunities, two areas that he mentioned is about energy and the Motor Vehicles Act. And these, again, are more like work in pipeline, at best to say, uh, in, in the sense that we get to see the economic realizations coming from these two initiatives. Uh, so as a practitioner, I was just wondering, on ground, where do you feel the opportunities are? Do you even see the opportunities? And can you be a little, can you throw some light on that? Okay. No, very 
good question. And I, yeah, I, this is, you're going to get a practitioner's res response on this. Uh, so if you look at BBIN, the informal trade is anyways happening. As I say, potatoes from Bhutan reach the markets of Kathmandu yeah, informally. So if you look at the informal trade that happens in the region, it's phenomenal. So fish from the markets of Dhaka get to the markets of Calcutta. Now how it came, you don't know, but it's happening. So this is, there is informal trade, informal movement of goods, that are, and also to a large extent informal movement of services. So you can be sitting in Kathmandu and you can be ordering things out of different parts of your BBI and countries and you can get it. Like in Thimpu, you can sit there and you can get handicrafts that are coming in from Kathmandu. And there's no formal mechanism for that, but it is happening informally. So this is, so basically a framework helps the informality to convert to formality or formal channels, like what we are seeing with payments now, which were earlier happening through Hundi and through you know, Hawala. That is all now because of uh, cheaper digital um, platforms, online banking, we see uh, the conversion of informal movement of money to formal channels. The similarly, uh, a framework that is there like BBIN uh, would ensure that whatever is informally happening can happen formally and which would benefit the governments from taxes because anyways it's very expensive to get things informally because there are lots of you know informal taxes and informal levies that you are paying and so 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 this is a region where there's a lot of activity already taking place there's economic activity if you look at around borders you know, there's a lot of activities taking place goods moving pe even po people are moving you know services are moving uh, so what we want, uh, what we are thinking of is that a formalization of all this would ensure that you know, the benefits are all formal and I think everybody in the, you know, sort of the value chain benefits out of that. Hopefully I answer your question. Any more questions? attempt by India to put something together failed because of our brotherly neighbor on the west mm. and the engines that drove all that acrimony how do we know that that will not be reflected in BBIN because you talked about the movement of goods and services but there's also a good movement of people into India from Bangladesh it's a huge problem the government of India handles it by refusing to re recognize the problem my own home in Delhi was burgled so I have personal experience. <laughs> and then the local Daroga said, ah, mujhe pata hai. sorry, I'm speaking in Hindi. I know it was a Bangladeshi, but he's run away. So he knew who it was and where he ran away. It's that bad. Uh, and we know what happens every time Prime Minister Modi visits Bangladesh and the IFS lies flat to its face that nothing happened. We know what happens every day, every time violence happens. How long can you keep papering over these things and build some Indo-Bangladeshi friendship? There isn't, I mean, Sheikh Hasina has made astounding statements. I have got nothing to do with diplomacy, so maybe that's why I can speak so freely. Uh, any sane country would say, what the hell? But India just papers over it, and how long can you keep papering over these things? I mean, 1930s and 40s, Gandhi and Nehru kept papering over a lot of things, and you know what happened in 1947. You cannot, as I said earlier, inexorable forces of history, they are just too powerful for a man and his 80, 90 year lifespan to change. Yeah, I think, uh, good question. Uh, the way I take this, because this is a question I get at many places, and this today you talk about Bangladesh, and uh, especially when I'm in, India, I get this question as to, you know, sort of Nepal being used as a uh, uh, sort of haven for terrorists to enter India. And I think it's uh, also we need to look at, be a bit more open in our thinking process. And I think we, this will be a good way to end this also, is that uh, we need to be open and have empathy about understanding. And so every time I was be confronted with this question in India, and I say that whenever there's a criminal activity in, um, in Nepal, if there's a shooting, the 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 sort of uh, the the shooting gang would have come from India, and uh, so most of the criminal activities that takes place in the borders of uh, Nepal, the criminals 
you know, sort of originate from India and our booming uh, wedding destination, uh, southern Nepal, as a booming wedding destination today, the towns of Butol and all have a lot of weddings. All Indians coming in purely when we interview them, they say, this is safe because we don't, you know, if our uh, daughters and daughters-in-laws are wearing 10 tolas of gold uh, necklace, they won't be robbed. So it's all about how people perceive uh, security in both sides, you know. And uh, so what we need to do is to have more empathy uh, and to look at this. This is a big issue. And, and I've been a big propagand of uh, securitized movement across borders. And this has been very successful in a more uh, problematic area of uh, East Africa, where you have a lot of people around moving, but they have been able to control the movement through ensuring that IDs are required, you are tracked, you are traced, and which has really made the borders more secure. And this is what I've been seeing in, with my own eyes in the past 10 years when this was introduced in, uh, in the borders in East Africa. Uh, before that, I was to be very scared to even move around. And even now, if you go to Congo and come back, because you're tracked, you know, the, everybody feels safe, there's more trade, there's more, and even during COVID, there was more uh, movement of goods and uh, people were dependent. And there's the food security was being taken care of because a lot of the food to Congo went in from Rwanda and it was uh, a controlled movement. So with that, over to you, Rajni. Right. Thank you. Um, I think it's a good place to end uh, this seminar there. Thank you to the audience for all the questions, and thank you to Mr. Sujeev Shakya for joining us today at ISAS. Yes. Thank you.